My name is Fabrizio Branca. I work for um, a company called AOE. Uh, I'm their lead um, system developer. And uh, you'll find me on GitHub and on Twitter. Uh, my handles are uh, FBRNC. Um, yeah, so I put this slide together a couple of years ago, and I like to bring it up every time because it nicely explains what's been going on in my life in the last couple of years. Um, so that's me. I used to work for AOE in Wiesbaden in Germany. And that's my wife, Janine, and our daughter, Fiona. And uh, over three years ago, we moved to the US. Um, I still work for AOE, but now that's AOE Inc. That's our US headquarters in San Francisco. Actually, it's in Burlingame, so who of you has been at the last Jenkins conference? It's right there at the Bay Shore, just like two minutes away from the Hyatt Hotel where the last conference was. So um, yeah, we got another child. His name is Leo. He's true American. And um, yeah, so it's been great being in the US. And um, OK, so before we get started, I'd like to ask you, who of you is actually doing continuous delivery today? Raise your hand. OK, that's quite a lot. Um, I have a confession to make. We don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think that's OK, and let me explain why. Uh, before, I really like this quote. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have to admit, continuous delivery is probably a very overloaded buzzword, and many people say they're doing that, but they might not really be doing it, and uh, you know, but it sounds good. And I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. Actually, I would like to do it a lot. And um, let me tell you what the basic difference between continuous integration and continuous delivery, in my opinion, is. So what continuous delivery is basically going through all the steps of your pipeline, actually deploying this, this project or product to, to the production environment. The main difference to continuous integration, in my opinion, is that it's basically the same thing, but the last step actually doesn't happen automatically, but it is an actual manual action. So um, the last step should also be automated, but it should just be triggered manually. So we actually have a Jenkins job that does everything automatically, but you actually have to trigger that job manually, and there's actually an input field where you have to type, yes, I know what I'm doing, just to avoid any mistakes. Um, so the reason why we do that is, uh, to be very honest, we have a ton of tests in place, but still it doesn't feel like somebody could just commit something to version control, and like an hour later it ends up on production. Um, there's always things going on. We always want re-QA, uh, a person look at that, we want, um, this build go to staging first and the client, client accept that. And after all, we're doing uh, scrum sprint cycles. And so we have a, a potential ship of product at the end of that sprint. So there is no need to have multiple deployments at, uh, multiple times per day. But we could, but we don't want to. We want somebody actually, a release manager to be the person to say, okay, we're good. This can go to production now. Okay, next question. Who knows what this is? <laughs> so this is a mug cake. Uh, I didn't know what this is until two weeks ago, and actually I ended up eating a lot of those last weekend trying to, do, uh, to, to, to make them. And this is super simple. It's just a little bit of flour, sugar, oil, milk, and then you put in blueberries, chocolate, chips, or nuts, or whatever. And then the best part is you put it in the microwave for 90 seconds, and it's done. It's a really delicious cake. So why I'm telling you that? <laughs> this is my keep it simple slide. Um, so we've gone through a ton of iterations of you know, Jenkins, Bill's, running and, um, and scripts, running shell scripts that again trigger a, a PHP framework and all that stuff. And things went wrong all the time and then we'd had such a hard time to figure out what was going wrong. So the lesson I learned in the last years is simple is always better. Um, this mug cake is super simple to do and uh, you end up you know, experimenting with that, adding other ingredients. And that's the same thing that happens to your Jenkins build. If every developer understands what's going on, he will be able to own that, or the team will be able to own that, to optimize that, and, um, and uh, if something goes wrong and things are, go wrong, then um, it's a lot easier to, um, to react with those. And it doesn't necessarily mean that things are, uh, are worse if they are uh, simpler and back to the basics. Um, okay, so uh, part of the title of this presentation is uh, Workflow and Patterns. Um, so why patterns? And um, so the answer is we are, um, 250 developers in eight different locations at AOE. So San Francisco is one, we have two locations in Germany, and another one in Switzerland, and so on. And um, we do so many different projects. Uh, we do a lot of e-commerce stuff, we do a lot of CMS stuff, we have a mobile team, uh, we have a team dealing with fr uh, solar and front-end guys and all that stuff. And uh, we've been asking ourselves, what's the perfect um, continuous whatever integration, delivery, deployment tool chain 
Um, and we built a couple of tools ourselves, but really there is no, not one, not a single one that fits everything. So one size doesn't fit at all. So instead we thought, let's come up with a shared uh, set of patterns with the vocabulary so that every person at AOE and hopefully beyond AOE knows exactly what it means to deploy something or to install something, what is the responsibility of a build and so on. So basically every, every team can decide what components to choose, how to mix and match them, and to build their own tool chain. But at the same time, um, of course, that tool, tool chain might be highly specific to, you know, if that is an AWS project, or if that is a um, client infrastructure deployment, or if that is, of course, a PHP-based commerce, or a Java-based uh, ESP stuff or uh, project, or whatever. But at the end, everybody say, speaks the same language, and we know um, this is the part that does, uh, produces a build artifact, and this is a portion that gets that to the server. Okay, let's first look at the big picture. Um, so this is a classic application lifecycle, planning, deploy, developing, deployment, test, release, deploy, and operate. Make something up there. Um, and there's a ton of buzzwords that start with continuous <laughs> around that whole pattern. Um, so that's continuous application lifecycle, and everything sounds better with continuous these days, right? Um, uh, Jenkins fits into this subset of those steps. Jenkins is basically the glue that helps you to create the builds, to run the tests, and um, to help you with release management, and actually, uh, ideally, also does the deployments for you uh, by just executing, running a job. Um, so let's look at the vocabulary first. Um, so let's say, so I'm talking about projects here, and that might be slightly different than talking about a product. So a project in our case is something that runs in one version for one customer in one infrastructure. It's not like a, a piece of software that people download and that has to run on uh, Macs, uh, Windows, in different versions. The process might be slightly different there, um, but we're talking about projects here, and I'm sure most of the things also apply to, uh, to product development. So project in our case is ra rarely just a simple platform. It's usually um, uh, a set of different um, um, platforms that talk to each other, like a, a CMS project, um, uh, talking to, to a Magento store, and uh, then usually we have um, a solar um, rendering the catalog and, and things like that. So, and it's usually different teams working on different subsets. So let's, talk, let's look at one application and um, yeah, so we have different snapshots in time called the builds, and a subset of these snapshots are the release candidates, and once a release candidate is actually deployed, then that's a release. Um, and the whole idea about continuous integration, of course, is to determine which ones are the release candidates, so to, to separate the good builds from the bad builds through, uh, by running the tests. Okay, then we have an environment. An environment usually runs one or more servers. Um, actually, it always runs one or more servers in our case. And um, on the servers, we have multiple instances, um, and one of those is usually the active one. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a different way of doing deployments later, but um, so that, that's a very common scenario. And then we have different environments, um, like we have the DevBox, which is usually Vagrant and uh, VirtualBox based in our case. We have the integration server, which is automatically built by the Jenkins server, um, which will, uh, is potentially broken, because that's the first time where the build gets installed. Then we have the deploy instance, which, is, um, uh, which has to build ma be built manually, but that also means it's a lot more stable. That's where content editors start editing content, or like uh, store owners would start adding the products and uploading media and, and so on. And then we have staging and production that ideally are um, set up the same way. Um, okay, so these are the four steps uh, when it comes to deployment, and I think it's very important to, to understand that these four steps are related but different. And in a lot of tools out there, there is no clean separation between those four steps. And that's, if, if there's a single thing you learn about this, uh, from this presentation, then be aware that these four things um, should be looked at separately. So the first thing is the build, provisioning, deployment, and installation. So the idea is to have um, a clear interface between those, three, uh, those steps. Those can be um, solved by the same tool, but probably they will not, and so there has to be a clear handoff. What is required by the provisioning? What's uh, the result of the build step? Where do we interchange artifacts and, um, and all that? So let's talk about the build first. Uh, so again, um, 
The build script, script um, should or could be a very simple shell script, so there is no need to coming up with something fancy here. Um, and um, it's basically part of the build job. So our build jobs, most cases, are um, checking out the source code in that particular snapshot and running the build script. And the build script is part of the project and knows what to do to actually uh, produce the, um, the result of the build step, which is an artifact. And so the next step is uh, provisioning, and that's kind of optional. You might have um, uh, more traditional um, infrastructures where the IT team sets up a server once and that's it. But in other infrastructures, you actually might have uh, a set of chef cookbooks and uh, would uh, reprovision uh, a server every time you do a deployment, or you would actually spin up a new EC2 instance every time you do a deployment or more than one. Um, the next thing is actually the deployment, and the deployment, again, could be a simple, uh, a simple shell script, or actually, for example, talking about Chef again, there is the deploy cookbook that is used, um, for example, by Opsworks or uh, Engineer uses that, and, um, and that actually opened my eyes a little bit of what does this generic cookbook know, and what's, what's the role of this cookbook and what isn't. So the deployment part actually only knows where to get that um, application and where to put it on the local server. So the deployment step actually manages different sim links, um, uh, manages different release folders on the server and makes sure the application ends up in the right place on that particular server. On the other hand, the installation, that's the other point of view, um, is application specific. So the, application, the installation doesn't know anything about um, where on that server am I or do I have to need to be, but it knows about uh, what do I need to do to actually get this application up and running. So the installation takes care of running any update scripts, running migrations, uh, clearing caches, um, uh, running indexers, and all that stuff that's application specific. And um, yeah, so the important thing here is actually deployment is very different from installation. And again, the deployment doesn't know anything about the application except where to get it from and where to put it, while the installation is the part that, um, that is um, application specific. And uh, I think that is basically the number one pattern when it comes to designing any continuous integration or delivery development um, tool chain. Okay, let's talk about builds now. Um, so what do we need to actually recreate an environment? Um, so number one rule here is um, there uh, can't be any manual interaction. So it's absolutely a no-go if um, after installing something, you have to go into the configuration and uh, update um, the URLs or the database settings or everything. So basically, everything has to be fully automated so you don't have to like, create CMS blocks or um, update settings or proc attributes in case of a Magento store and all that stuff. All of that basically needs to be part of your, um, your installation or your deployment script. So we have basically two things. We have the actual build package, that's the artifact, the, the result of the build st um, job. And in this case, in, for, in, 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 uh, in, this, in the case of a Magento project, that would be the Magento core, a number of modules, um, settings, we'll talk about that in a second, uh, some scripts and some tools. And then, of course, that is only a snapshot of the code base. The other thing actually would be the, the user data, and we call that the system storage. It's basically an artifact repository where we both have a database dump that's usually like a nightly snapshot and a dump of the media directory uh, where like all the product images live, where all the CMS images live, where all basically the user data lives. And um, so it's, it's these two things that you need to be able to recreate any environment from scratch. And that's actually not only what you can do, but what you should do. So whenever you install a new build, um, you should do that in an environment that's as close as possible to production. So that's why we wipe out the database and install a new database um, dump whenever we deploy to any of the environments um, during the pipeline. And um, yeah, so we just use S3 for both of them. So we upload our packages and, and the um, uh, nightly backups to S3, uh, since it's so easy to interact with S3 and to, to get the data back from there. Okay, so let's talk about settings. Um, what is a setting? So a setting basically is everything that's different between two environments. And there are some very obvious things, I mentioned it before, um, the URLs. Uh, so the staging environment most likely has a different set of URLs uh, than your production environments. Um, then of course there's database settings or like if you're using Redis, you might be using different parts of your infrastructure. Um, for uh, Magento stores, you most likely want your staging environment to use different um, payment provider credentials like a sandbox mode. Uh, and then you have feature flags. There's a ton of things. We have projects where we have um, 
more than 500 of those different settings. We have a tool called the Environment Settings Tool, which is like a PHP-based thing uh, that helps you to manage these in, in a CSV file. And uh, depending on the environment, um, it will basically apply all these settings uh, in, in different um, places where they need to be applied. But that's only one side. The other side is actually settings injection. And very similar to what we know as dependency injection in the software world, there are things that our, our builds or our project shouldn't have to have any knowledge about. For example, um, database credentials or um, uh, the Redis URLs or all that stuff that's basically provided by the infrastructure. So here basically we inverse the control. It's the infrastructure letting the build package know um, here's the database that you should be using or here's the, the, the Redis instance or uh, don't know, the memcache, whatever, everything that's provided by, by the uh, infrastructure, even down to um, these are um, the host names that, I, uh, that I'm pointing to the V hosts um, that uh, you'll be installed in. And usually they hand off our environment variables and our tool where you can pick these things up and inject it from the environment variables. But that, of course, results in our settings file that is part of the project not containing any sensitive data. And also, if we um, end up you know, replacing the database for whatever reason, we don't have to do a redeployment uh, because we just basically trigger a new installation and we'll pick up the new database settings from the environment. Okay, so now let's dig a little bit deeper into um, an example deployment pipeline. So let's say we have a developer here and the developer works on his local machine, which is usually uh, a vagrant box using VirtualBox. Um, so even on a Mac or on a Linux, um, every team member actually has a virtualized uh, development environment where this project runs. And so this developer writes code. And of course, we have more than one developer working on a project. Um, and these developers are usually, uh, they're also writing code and they're spread over different locations. So we have <laughs> some Italians, Germans, uh, yeah. And so while most of the time we do awesome stuff, sometimes bad things happen and every single line of code, of course, can potentially break production. And the whole goal here is to, um, to separate the good builds from the bad builds to find out which build actually is okay and which one isn't, which one turns into a release candidate, which one will actually end up on production, which one doesn't. That's basically in a nutshell what continuous integration is all about, right? Um, so all of them use um, version control and actually, even before code hits version control, just by looking at the file, you could already detect, okay, there's no way something good can come out of this file. So you can run PHP land or XML um, syntax um, checks or JavaScript, or there's a number of things that you can easily and very quickly determine in a pre-commit hook and even prevent these files to ever hitting Git. There's no reason to trigger uh, a Jenkins job if we already know that this file will result in a syntax error. Um, so then uh, once in version control, uh, we uh, do um, code reviews. Uh, and uh, most teams use um, Crucible for that. And um, um, yeah, and then depending on the workflow of that individual team, uh, the code has already been merged or will still be merged. So I've, I've ignored that uh, portion here. Uh, so once the, the code is ready, um, that's the point where we actually create a build. So as I mentioned before, the build actually contains everything um, you need to recreate a system. Actually, this one, this slide shows it contains the, a database snapshot, but it doesn't usually. Well, of course, with a small project you could, but usually that will be pulled in from the artifact repository. And um, so this build basically uh, is, is a job that runs in Jenkins. Um, it's triggered either automatically by, by a commit that's done, or it can be a nightly build, or you could trigger it manually depending on, on your workflow. And um, except for checking out the code and packaging it, more steps could happen here. A classic example, of course, would be uh, minifying JavaScript and CSS files, and there's like compiling um, CSS. There's a lot more stuff that you can do even in a web project that runs uh, PHP code like in most of our projects where there's no actual compilation step. Um, and then the result would be like uh, an actual TARGC file or, of course, a virtual package, which is basically just um, a hash or um, a tag um, or basically just like a, a pointer to that's the snapshot that we want. We actually do tar GCs, but there is no reason, uh, especially if you don't need to do any modifications to the files to just remember that snapshot and to pass that snapshot uh, from build step to build step. So um, let's look back for a little bit. 
Um, so what we're doing here is eating our own dog food. That build that we just created is actually exactly the same build that we will end up installing our day, uh, dev boxes. Um, using the same installers, as I mentioned before, using um, uh, potentially the same deploy um, tool. Uh, it's either the chef recipe or like a simple chef um, um, shell script. And um, so the developer actually run, works on the exact same build that might end up on production. Okay, let's go back. Um, so once we have the build, um, we can do some tests by simply looking at the files without having to execute them. And those are called static, um, st st called static code analyzers. And in the PHP world, there uh, is a number of tools out there, like code sniffer, uh, copy paste detector, and uh, some dependency um, tools. Um, the next step after that um, would be to install the build to a system we call integration. So that is a real system with a real database um, that you, can act, you could actually access, um, but um, uh, in many cases, nobody is actually looking at that since this is potentially rebuilt many times per day. So it might be gone out of nothing while you're trying to do something there. So it's really meant to be um, the, uh, the, the playground for Jenkins to do the things. And the reason why we have to have a working system there is simply for the next steps when we run the unit tests, uh, at least for Magento projects, and that's probably true for many other projects out there, you actually need a working environment. So these are kind of not really true unit tests in many cases uh, because they kind of implicitly test the database and the cache storage and all that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what it is. So that's why before we do any real tests, we install um, this build on, on a system first. And of course, that's already the first criteria. If the installation fails, then we're done here because then we know there is no reason to try to run any tests. So this, this build already failed in the, uh, in the most basic uh, thing that it should be doing, and that's being installable. Um, yeah, so we run a number of tests here. So we have the unit test, we use, P we use PHP unit for that. Then um, we have a series of integration tests. Uh, that again is PHP unit, uh, but, in, uh, but doing other things. So that's testing any APIs that we might consume or any APIs that we might expose. Um, that's also making sure that, for example, if we have, if Varnish is part of our setup, um, that uh, things are cached and purged correctly. So that's more the, the higher level um, view on the project. And uh, then after that, we run Oh yeah, so we, you, you can add any number of steps in between, of course, depending on the project. So for Magento projects, we have a tool called um, uh, AOE PMD, um, a project mess detector that checks for some Magento specific things like um, rewrite conflicts or core hacks, or like just some Magento things. And then um, for CMS projects, you could have something like a crawler that checks for broken links or for uh, W3C validity. So there's a number of things that uh, you could add in between to uh, improve the quality. It's basically filters, right? To uh, make sure that a build that you're that you, uh, about to deploy actually meets all criteria. Um, so when we're done with that and everything passes so far, we do our Selenium tests. Um, so uh, we use Selenium for our acceptance tests. And, um, and that is, um, so we, we, we built a, a PHP um, tool for that called Menta that um, uses Selenium WebDriver for that and allows us to write um, um, tests nicely. And then we run these tests. And we run these tests in different flavors, basically. So for um, uh, one of our projects, for example, we have a store that does not only have a US storefront, uh, but comes in, in different storefronts. So all of a sudden, we have like five different flavors of that store that we all should test individually. Uh, then, of course, it's a responsive project. So we need to test different um, screen sizes. And uh, we have 20 different versions now. And then, of course, uh, testing that in Firefox only is probably not a safe bet. Uh, so let's test Firefox, Chrome, and probably Internet Explorer, and all of, all of a sudden you have a, a huge number of tasks here. And we use um, Jenkins' uh, multi-configuration job for that, and that works great. Um, and uh, actually, we use Sauce Labs um, for uh, actually running those tests, which is also great, and there is a good Jenkins plugin that helps you to do that. For the multi-configuration job, 
And there's this thing of defining a touchstone job. So you pick one job that you expect um, to uh, work fine, and only if this one um, finishes successfully, all the other jobs will be executed. And the reason, of course, is uh, running Selenium jobs is um, slow and expensive. Uh, so you'd much rather test one specific uh, setup because something might be broken that's not language or screen size uh, or browser specific. Something might be broken because actually uh, something is wrong with your product. And then it's okay to already find that out by running a single job instead of then running uh, these jobs ideally in parallel, which again is something that SauceNaps helps you doing. Um, okay, so when we're done with that, um, yeah, so uh, some of our teams actually uh, use uh, other things instead or on top of Selenium tests, uh, for example, Behat or uh, Cucumber. Uh, and then we have uh, created a tool called uh, PDIF, which compares uh, two screenshots from two different builds and highlights um, the visual difference between those. So this is meant actually for a human to look at these um, screenshots and there's a nice slider where you can drag uh, and, and see what, what changed. And of course, some changes, so a difference doesn't necessarily mean something is wrong. Uh, that's why we need a human to actually look at those. Uh, it might be that's the new feature that we implemented or that's the CSS we fixed. Uh, but in, in some cases, that helps uh, to find out if visually something is wrong. For example, uh, a menu item is missing or I don't know, something is misplaced. Uh, then this, this build, ends up on staging, and uh, since staging ideally is set up the same way production is, that's usually a multi-server setup, and um, we, um, um, some, one of the tools that I like using a lot is AWS Opsworks, so that's, it's super simple to trigger a deployment uh, via Jenkins through the AWS API and have things installed both on staging or production uh, just by basically doing two API calls. And that's how the package ends up on staging. And that's where the client um, does the final QA and uh, gives us the go um, to deploy this on production. Um, so, oh yeah, before it goes to production, we do stress tests. Uh, to be honest, that's not necessarily part of our continuous deployment pipeline. So we basically do this when we think we need to do this. Uh, we, we, there's no project where that we would do this every, on every single build. Um, but the idea here is to spin up a couple of EC2 instances and then to stress test staging and uh, to find out if there's any regression in performance. Um, we used to manage that ourselves to spin up EC2 instances, uh, but again, there's an excellent service out there, Blaze Meter, um, that allows you to do that uh, nicely and it also comes with a nice Jenkins plugin uh, that makes it a lot easier. Because after all, it's hard to um, generate enough traffic if your application is designed in a, in a nice, uh, in, 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 in a good way. Um, so, if everything is okay, actually we're ready to deploy it to production. Um, so let's quickly talk about deployments here. So the requirements are actually, it's, um, it's a zero downtime deployment, so the user actually doesn't know anything, and that's why we deploy the new build in the background, and once you're ready, we switch something. And I'll show you two different options that we usually do. Um, and um, again, multiple servers, auto-scaling, that of course has some impact on how you design your infrastructure. So, Talking about green-blue deployments, um, there is two different options. So this is reusing the same set of servers, basically installing your build in a different release folder, and once this is done on all the servers, you switch all the sim links. Um, this is what AWS Opsworks does, um, and it works well, uh, but actually if it's up to us, we prefer this, and that is spinning up a new set of EC2 instances. Again, if everything is automated with Chef, for example, um, you, this is something that doesn't require any manual interaction and it takes like something between five and 10 minutes to spin up a, a new EC2 instance that then is ready to install your build. Um, so all that happens in the background while not being live, um, but QA could access that. We could do, we can, and we actually do have some cache forming there. And once we feel this is ready, we switch um, the pointer in Route 53, which is AWS's um, DNS service. Um, the public interfacing DNS doesn't change, so there is no DNS propagation delay. Uh, that is an instant action. And once uh, everything is, uh, the traffic is hitting the new environment and we confirm that everything works fine, uh, we shut down the old EC2 instance. So in EC2 instance at this point really becomes uh, like a throwaway instance that in some cases only is up and running for the duration of, uh, be between two builds, uh, two, two production deployments, which might be like a day or a week or whatever. So we don't care about those. 
Um, yeah. So once we deploy to production, uh, we are not done yet because the deployment should not necessarily mean that we released any features. So where possible, we actually um, like to uh, encapsulate our features in feature flags and have them disabled by default. That's not always possible in a nice way, but when it is, then we like to do this. So that means we actually deploy a package with all the new stuff disabled. Um, and then uh, once we feel, okay, now we can enable this feature, we do this, but it's decoupled. It's not, um, it's not part of the deployment. It's just uh, now we're enabling this feature, and if something goes wrong, we disable it again. Okay, so this, in a nutshell, is our continuous integration slash delivery slash deployment pipeline. And um, yeah, so uh, an important aspect of that is to visualize the progress. Um, so visualization should look like something like that, where you have um, the build that starts on the left, and then it tries to make its way as far as possible to the right. Um, that's basically these, these filter criteria. If um, the build made, it, made its way, made it all the way to the right, it's basically a risk candidate, and then it's only a political thing if that should go to production or not. Uh, but uh, not all builds may get that far. Um, yeah, so what we use here is the um, uh, Jenkins uh, deployment uh, pipeline plugin. Uh, we have not been doing the transition to using the new workflow features, but this so far works fine for us. Uh, this is the default plugin with some CSS um, styling that actually shows um, us, uh, shows the, um, the, how, how far the, the, the build got. And in addition to that, we use the uh, promoted build plugins. So actually, um, we can only deploy builds to staging if all the tests pass, and we can only deploy builds to production if it was deployed to staging, which implies that all the tests pass. Um, so that's basically a nice um, firewall for ourselves um, to uh, make sure builds don't accidentally get uh, um, installed to production. Okay, so um, this is actually a requote from one of our client's uh, project managers. So basically the outcome of this thing is um, allowing you to be fast. Um, so if everything is automated, uh, basically the only thing you actually deal with is writing code and writing tests and then waiting. And ideally uh, from committing code to having a release candidate, um, in our case for this project, uh, that's like 20 minutes in between. Um, and uh, actually, Tom pinged me yesterday night again. Uh, that's actually yesterday at eight, uh, asking me if uh, this thing that we have been developing uh, was ready. And uh, it was, but it wasn't deployed to staging yet. And I deployed that, and uh, he was super happy with that. And um, yeah, so it's it is really fun. Uh, and by that time, I didn't actually I hadn't asked him if I could <laughs> use uh, his quote on the slide. So I thought, okay, maybe I should ask him now. Um, Okay, so I have one more thing to show you, um, and uh, that's kind of unrelated, uh, or maybe it is related. So um, I am a big fan of microcontrollers and electronics and making things. Um, so um, IoT stands for um, Internet of Things, which is another buzzword, uh, maybe a little bit, uh, there's no big overlap to the Jenkins community maybe, but um, there uh, is amazing things you can do with that. So um, who has seen or used an Arduino before here? Okay, well, so there is a big overlap. <laughs> uh, so Arduinos are amazing, uh, but they lack uh, um, of internet connectivity. So you have to buy um, some Wi-Fi or Ethernet shields, and they're expensive. And um, uh, last year, something new came up uh, called the ESP8266, uh, um, and you can get them for like two or three dollars with free shipping, uh, so it's amazing. And there are microcontrollers, you can actually upload um, um, code there. Uh, it also has like a, a, a Lua runtime, so you can do things with that in a really nice way. And it has IO pins that allow you to actually control things. So that's nice, and that's uh, what I've been using. But then there's another thing that came up, and that's the Photon from Particle, which is basically also a Wi-Fi chip. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's totally worth it, their money. It's money, uh, it comes with like a nice web IDE and takes care of uh, reverse tunnel and all that stuff. So it, it's, it's a little bit uh, less basic than dealing with the ESP8266. So, and that's one of the things I built. And I actually brought it with me here. 
so by, um, I, I don't have a live demo, uh, but there's a video on YouTube that you can actually look at. Uh, so what this is, is this is a regular clock uh, where I replace the clockwork and uh, I, I'm driving that with the microcontroller where I actually can make this, uh, this hand move. And there's another um, uh, LCD display and um, it's super easy to come up with a very simple REST API where you can tell the display what to show or the hand where to point to. So the idea here is that Jenkins, when it starts a step, uh, will move that hand to the right place. And then depending on it failing or it moving to the next step, it will continue to move. So this on, in your dev team's room's wall can nicely show where you are right now. And actually there's like a little um, speaker here that will like do some alerts if something goes wrong or if the build succeed. So that's one of the things, um, I actually built another one that looks a little less nice, uh, but it's at least as annoying. And that's this thing here, and the idea is that this actually rings a bell, and uh, this thing here uh, moves depending on uh, the build status. So this is more like showing an individual thing. Uh, again, it's, I didn't hook it up because I didn't know if the Wi-Fi here was doing things. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the idea here is actually, this is super easy. I didn't get into the whole micro thing up until like a couple of months ago, and it's super fun. I can only encourage you to start playing with that. And so with the ESP8266 and like a 433 megahertz transmitter, you can get those from eBay for a dollar with free shipping again, and then go to Home Depot, pick up some of those power control outlets, and you can easily switch a lamp on or off. And you don't even have to deal with high voltage things because they are like physically separated. Uh, this is something uh, you can build in minutes. And once you have this in place, of course, nothing stops you from hooking anything up to, your, uh, to, to the outlet and have anything indicate that your build failed or not. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's it from my side. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, again, Twitter, my website, the AO website, or via email. And um, yeah, that's our sponsors, thank you. <laughs>